Hey, it's the Analytics Dude, and I'm back with part three of the Kaggle Titanic machine learning tutorial. Now that we produced a working model in part two, it's time to do something called feature engineering. So what are features? Features are essentially the data that goes into the model. You can think of it uh, along the same lines as an independent variable in statistics. So what is feature engineering then? Well, Wikipedia defines it as the process of using domain knowledge of the data to create features that make machine learning algorithms work. What that literally means is doing something to the data to make the model perform better. This could mean regularizing the data. It could mean applying it to a logarithmic scale instead of an absolute one. Or it could mean creating a new feature that captures the way two other features interact with each other. I'll explain with an example that I worked on. I helped a retailer build a model to predict when inventory was not available on the shelves. One of the features that we engineered that turned out to be important was when the inventory was a multiple of the pack size. Here's how that would work. Let's say product A comes in packs of six. Yesterday, the inventory was 15, but today the inventory is only 12. That increases the likelihood that it's not available on the shelf. Why? Well, what often happens is three items would be out on the shelf and two full packs are somewhere else in the store. Customers come in and buy those three items, but nobody unpacks the other two full packs. Obviously, that's not the case every time, but adding that feature to the model with things like sales velocity and inventory significantly improved the performance or accuracy of the model. Machine learning models that produce value in the real world typically require this type of effort. Stanford professor and machine learning guru Andrew Ng is quoted as saying, coming up with features is difficult, time consuming, and requires expert knowledge. Applied machine learning is essentially feature engineering. So if you're wondering why the data scientists that you work with can't come up with a model as quickly as we did in parts one and two, there you go. You can probably guess how much effort it took to come up with a pack size example. I don't remember exactly, but it was enough. There is something new and exciting in feature engineering called automated feature engineering. There are tools like H2O.AI and Data Robot that can automate much of the process. This saves a ton of time and manual effort for data scientists. Now, there are some people who think that these are replacements for data scientists. I don't see it that way. I see them as a tool for data scientists to work much faster and try out more options more quickly. Kind of like giving a chainsaw to a lumberjack who was previously just using a big ax. With all that in mind, now let's uh, dive into the Titanic Kaggle and see if we can engineer some new features to make our model perform better. So my first idea for feature engineering is to group the ages. Now the way that our ages are right now is every single age is a string, meaning every single age is its own thing. So the model sees a 26 year old is different from a 27 year old is different from a 28 year old. When in reality, I mean, we should probably consider them all adults. There's not any real reason why a 26-year-old and a 28-year-old's uh, survival chances should be different. But a 28-year-old and an 8-year-old, okay, there's differences there. you got a grown-up versus a child. Somebody might be caring for it. Women and children first, whatever. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make groups of the ages. I'm going to call them age brackets. And we're going to use that to replace the age itself in the model. So what you have to do that is with something called the rule engine. And this is the first part of NIME that I don't really consider super, uh, super beginner friendly. So get rid of that node right there. And we gotta connect that in there. And so our rule engine, what we have to do is, so you have to actually physically write the statements in here. And so we're gonna make our age brackets. So age, when it's less than three, then you use this, uh, equal arrow kind of like that and we're going to say that is an infant double click age again and whoops shift less than 12 um and then oops you gotta capitalize true which is basically just setting the default uh to other All right, and now uh, this part we're here, so we can either replace a column, meaning you know one of the columns are just going to get replaced with whatever this is. But I don't want to do that. I want to create a new column, and I'm going to call it age bracket as I previous. So let's run that and see what happens. Got the output here. Should have there you go. A new column called age bracket, and those are all filled in with people 
I'm just going to give a quick scan, make sure there's nothing missing. Bigger, more complex data, I'd use a group by node to do that, but quick scan, everything worked. The numbers are continuous. All right, we're ready to get our scores, and all right, we had a decent improvement. Before, we were at 80.4, and now we're at 82.123. So that's a pretty good result. Um, the you know, extra almost 2% there could be meaningful. I have one more idea for feature engineering that we could fit in, and it has to do with the missing values. So, well, wrong one. So in this rule engine, when we classify them into groups, any missing uh, age gets cast as an other. But I mean, we know they're different, right? They're not all going to be the same thing. Um, and But is there a way that we can guess at it? Well, yeah, I think there is. So let's take this missing example, for instance. Uh, we see it's Mrs. Fatima Musulmani. Well, a Mrs. is not an infant, it's not a child, might be a teenager, probably an adult, might be a senior. Well, we can eliminate infant and child from that so we can just guess as to what that is. Um, and we can do that for a lot of different things. Like we see a miss here. Well, this is 1911, um, so there's not a whole heck of a lot of unmarried adult females. It's much less likely. So we can feel pretty safe classifying this as a teenager or child. Um, and believe it or not, we can do the same thing with uh, men. Uh, young, rather boys, uh, master, master, Gusta, whatever, Paulson, master is actually a, an old title uh, given to a young boy. So it says master on here, it's, they're saying it's, hey, this isn't a mister, this isn't a, this isn't a grown man, that's a little boy. So we can use that to uh, say that anytime we see a missing and it's a master, we can say it's a boy. So let's walk through how to do that right now. First thing we need to do is we need to manipulate those strings. We need to pull out those um, those titles. Now that's um, this is the part where it gets into a little bit of coding. This is actually really similar to Excel coding. So the name is a string, and we need a piece of it, which is going to be called a substring. Where'd it go? Substring. So this is the one we want. Is it's saying here? So the substring is first. You're looking at what string you're looking at. Where do you want to start cutting a piece of it? And how long do you want that piece to be? So the string we want is, of course, name. Now, where do we, where does it want us to start? Well, it's different in every single one because it goes last name, comma, uh, space, first name. Well, we can use that comma. And so the way we do that is we look at it, index. There we go, index of characters, the string, and then, you know, what characters? So it's basically, we're gonna say, hey, this is a name. Oop, wrong button. This is the name. And then when you get to the character, comma, start counting. But we don't actually want to start counting at the comma because then it's going to show comma space. We want to count two after that uh, to get rid of the comma and the space so we go plus two. And then we want our uh, substring to be four characters long because the shortest title, Mr., is going to be MR period space. Um, if we go over that, then we're going to start, you know, getting in the first letters of first names, and it's going to be yeah. super hard to class. There's two options here. Replace column means basically I can take one of these and just replace the values that's in there with whatever I just calculated. I don't want to do that. I want to create a new column, but I don't want to title new column because I'm not that lazy. So I'm going to call it first four title. Uh, also, it gets confusing if you just have everything be new column. Um, so yes, we're cool with that. And let's execute it, make sure that came through. Ah, perfect. We get a string, first four title, Mr. And it doesn't look like we have any extraneous letters. That's great. So then the next thing we need to do is we need to use those things to produce an age group. And so we produce an age group. Um, the data goes in there. Let's configure this. And so how we're going to do that is we're going to say that first four title, for, well, the way I think about it is I'm going to create my new column first. We have age bracket already. Uh, so I'm going to call this age bracket two. And then we'll be able to compare the two later uh, and use age bracket two when it's missing. So what I'm going to go here is I'm going to go first four title um, and then in. In is a SQL command. And for some reason in here, it actually needs to be capitalized. Um, you can see the list of the commands up here and um, kind of a, a syntax for them. So in, and then that's going to be a list, and we're going to show all the adult ones here. So the adult ones are Mrs. 
and you got to go comma in between them because they're strings they got to be in quotation marks mr period space that space needs to be there or it won't work doctor period space uh, that's the list and then we're going to say they all equal adult and once again it needs to be um, in quotations because it is a string so then we have first four title now let's do the children's titles so we have miss we have mast just master just the first four letters of it and that equals um and we could say infant we could say teenager but i'm going to say child um no particular reason there it's just kind of arbitrary you have to pick something so now let's run that see what we get classified values age bracket ah okay i just realized something so there's no age bracket one in here because we did the age bracket one up here we haven't done it down here so this allows me to show you something kind of neat control c copy control v paste just like you're in excel really i know so roll that through make sure that's all configured so it's going to look at age does the exact same thing spits out to other okay oops i wasn't meant to execute that all right and now we have our final rule engine which is um to choose which age bracket it looks like, looks at. So we want to use the age bracket one whenever possible because, um, because that's the real one. And so we're actually going to replace that when necessary. So what we're going to say is the syntax of this is missing. So missing, and then use the variable, which is age bracket, then it equals age bracket two. True, which is the default option, age bracket. So what this essentially does saying, if the age bracket is missing, then use age bracket two. Else, just use age bracket. Basically an if else statement, but not as easy to read as an if else statement in my opinion, which is one of the few qualms I have with uh, with nine so let's execute that let's see how that works really yeah no why didn't that's age bracket two not age bracket one okay age bracket one looks like we've got everything in there okay and now for the moment of truth we need to of course uh disconnect this one come on And instead, connect our new stuff to the exact same model. And remember, it was, I think, 82% last time. Let's see how it does when we roll through it again. Boom. It got worse. Now, this is something that I knew was going to happen because um, I played around with this a bunch of times. The first time we ran the model, the random forest predictor, we got 80.4%. That really surprised the heck out of me. I don't know if you heard that in my voice on the video, because when I did this, I pre-flighted all my stuff and I was only getting 75% each time. Um, it will change every single time because the random forest involves random selections. So there's a different seed each time and it will select different trees randomly each or a different set of values randomly each time. If we had gone with a much higher number of trees, then we would probably not see nearly as much variance in here uh, but we didn't so it's act there's actually a great deal of randomness to how it does each time so it's entirely possible that that 77 percent is actually better than the 80.4 we saw or the 80 point or 82.0 we saw when we just added the initial age groups um, but that's the nature of random force they truly are random once again, you can address that by, you know, having much larger model sizes with uh, way more trees in them. Do I think that this, um, oh, and when I pre flighted it, when I edited it, I went from 75 for the original to 80 when I added in the age groupings, and then it went to 84 when I added um, this grouping in. So despite the fact that our accuracy actually went down, do I think this is a better model? Yeah, I do. Um, and if I were really pursuing this, if this was something production related, um, A, I would test it multiple times because the, the logic is sound for, um, for why we would do things that way rather than just classifying missing as other. Um, and I would make the model larger. And that's it for this tutorial. So we've imported and cleaned data.
we've built a model that works, and then we've engineered features to make it work better. All in all, we got to 82% accuracy on predicting survivors. That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Did you learn something from this? Please comment below and, and tell me what you learned. Here's what I hope you learned or what you realized. I hope you realize that Nime is easy enough to use, accessible, and extremely powerful. I hope you realize that data science is a combination of math, programming, and domain or business knowledge. And I hope you realize that data scientist's job is incredibly difficult. You saw that in feature engineering where we put together something that should have worked and yet it kind of didn't really in that one instance. So that's the appreciation that I want you to take out. And I, more than anything, would love if you would just download NIME and start playing around with it. If you have questions, ask me. Post them on the NIME forums or just look up other YouTube videos on this. It's a powerful tool, it's free, and it's accessible enough for beginners. So give it a shot. Till next time, I'm the Analytics Dude. Thanks for watching.